Across the land and in our deep seas, an army of people is working flat out to meet our energy demands. We are fundamentally splitting the atom. This is the story of those at the sharp end of the power industry. Energy production is changing. In this series, we find out how it works. When you are trying to achieve two thousandths of an inch on something that weighs 80 or 90 tonnes, that's what sorts the men from the boys. From nuclear energy and offshore gas, to biomass and harnessing the wind, it's energy production on an epic scale. In this episode, I meet the people who love working in the nuclear age. People always say that it's not rocket science working here. No, but it is nuclear physics. This is how our power is made. trip along the coastline of the northwest of England and there are three buildings that are impossible to miss. One's the Blackpool Tower and the others are these two giant structures at Hesham near Morecambe. They're nuclear power stations and between them they provide enough energy to power more than four million homes. Hesham is the largest operating nuclear site in Britain and has been powering the country for almost 40 years. The two large structures are Hesham 1 and Hesham 2. Each building contains two advanced gas-cooled reactors and between them they pump out more than 2.3 gigawatt of energy to the national grid. The UK's nuclear stations meet around 20% of the country's power needs. And it's Richard Bradfield who's in charge of Hesham One. Its reactor hall is the size of a cathedral and is dedicated to splitting the atom. We're just about to walk onto the top of Reactor One, one of our two reactors here at Hesham One. If we look down at our feet here, you can see we've got the fuel, 324 fuel channels. If we look behind us, down, down that way, you can see the fueling machine, and that sits at the moment over reactor two. So we're really right on top of where the nuclear reaction occurs underneath us, on top of the reactor pressure vessel, which generates the heat to heat the water into steam to drive the turbine to generate electricity. Hesham One's fueling machine is vital to keeping the station going. It's huge, 28 metres tall, and weighs 75 tonnes. The machine removes and adds nuclear fuel to the reactor core. Just a small fraction of the fuel is replaced every few months. It's a precise process and happens very slowly. The machine has a top speed of just 19 feet a minute or a quarter of a mile an hour. So we've speeded up the footage so you can see it in all its glory. Nuclear energy is complex, but at its heart, it's a process that makes heat in a controlled way. It begins when millions of small uranium pellets inside fuel pins are placed in the reactor core. A chain reaction takes place around the fuel pins. Atoms are split, releasing lots of energy in the form of heat. Temperatures inside the core can reach more than 600 degrees Celsius. By using carbon dioxide gas, the heat is then transferred to huge boilers to create superheated steam. The steam spins turbines at 3,000 revolutions per minute, powering generators to provide electricity for our homes. It's pretty basic nuclear physics that humans, being the people we are, innovate technology and it's driven us to a position where we can safely generate nuclear power. For obvious reasons, the risk of radiation is taken very seriously. Levels are constantly monitored, and it's Simon Gora's job to make sure strict guidelines are maintained. 
we have electronic personal dose meters. So these will record the dose that people are getting inside the reactor building, but they'll also alarm if anybody goes in an area where the dose rates are higher than expected. This tells me what I've got in my current month. Uh, so I've had zero microsieverts of dose this month, and over the course of the year, 25 microsieverts, which, as I say, is very low. It's, it's really comparable to maybe a, a chest X-ray or something like that. On a yearly basis, the average person gets about 2,600 2, microsieverts, just living their everyday life. That's from cosmic radiation, radiation from natural sources. Our, our typical doses here to an average worker are maybe 10, 20 microsieverts. So it's a very small amount on top of their everyday background radiation dose. Throughout the reactor hall, there are scanners to check levels, and staff are monitored again when they leave the area. Front measurement. At the moment, it is checking the front of my body and my helmet and also my arms to see that they're clean. Back measurement. Now I turn around and the monitor is checking Five, my back and also uh, the front three, of my hands to see they're two, clean as well. One, no contamination. And as expected, perfectly clean. Hesham isn't the only major nuclear facility in the northwest of England. Just over 30 miles away, on the outskirts of Preston, is the Springfields nuclear fuel site. They've been working with radioactive material here since the 1940s. It was once a government facility. Now it's owned by the global nuclear company Westinghouse. This is where Hesham's nuclear fuel is made. Uranium dioxide is baked into thumbnail-sized pellets, which are inserted into steel pins. These go inside a graphite sleeve, which will be placed in the nuclear reactor. It's a highly automated process, but still relies on the human touch. And if you visit here, there's one thing that's hard to ignore. This constant beeping means the radiation monitoring system is functioning. It's a key safety feature. And for foreman Peter Waldron, who's worked here for 14 years, it's a noise he's just got used to. I only ever notice it when people mention it now, to be honest. Uh, if I'm ever talking to anybody over the phone that has never been here, they go, what's that noise? I said, oh, it's just, that's just our, our beep bot. That just keeps us safe. Uranium fuel pellets are tiny, but can create a huge amount of energy. Each one is the equivalent of burning one and a half tonnes of coal. 64 of them are placed inside a fuel pin. They'll stay in the nuclear reactor for seven years. And for Springfield's David Shaw, that adds up to a lot of power. Out of the AGR facility last year, we produced the equivalent of 12 and a half million tonnes of coal. So that's coal that we've not burnt for energy. Um, nuclear energy provides reliable, safe fuel, contributing to the UK's target of zero, net zero. And that's something we're very proud of here at Springfields. In this factory, precision is everything. People always say that it's not rocket science working here. No, but it is nuclear physics. We are constantly um, checking the quality of the product. Um, there are some parts where you're allowed a certain leeway as to, as to what sort of things you can have, but there are other parts where you've, you've got to go down to a thou of an inch. So if there's a scratch that's two thou, which we can measure, we've got to scrap that part, we can't use it. I do take pride in the fact that they have never had, they've never found a defect part in a nuclear reactor that has been made in this factory, ever. As well as a huge sense of pride amongst those who work in the nuclear industry, there's also a little bit of friendly rivalry. Hesham is the only place in Britain with two nuclear power stations. Each has around 500 permanent staff, so Time to catch up with their station directors, Richard Bradfield and Mark Lees. So, Richard, you're in charge of Hesham One. 
Mark, Heesham 2 is your pride and joy. Yeah. Which is the best power station? It's a pretty easy one to answer, isn't it? It's got to be Heesham 1, hasn't it, Mark? No, you've got that answer completely wrong, Richard, and you know it. Go on, and, and for why? It's clearly Heesham 2. I think we're both in a pretty privileged position. We've both worked at both power stations. Ah. So uh, if you ask maybe some of the other 500, you'll get a slightly different opinion. 500 here at Heesham 2, or the 500 over there at Heesham 1. And it's really nice, Keeley, because the uh, staff are rightly proud of what they do. So they put their heart and soul to their work all the time. And it's right that they think their station's the best station, and that's great. When it comes to bragging rights, Heesham 1 is the oldest. Started as a hole in the ground in 1970 and started generating electricity in 1983. I think I'm going to give you that one, Richard, <laughs> because we didn't start until 1988 producing power. But Heesham 2 is slightly more powerful. We can produce uh, 1,320 megawatts uh, of power. Now, that's, that's how much we can produce, but uh, last year we produced more than 10 terawatt hours, which is the third highest ever amount of power produced in a, a nuclear power station in the UK. And Heesham 2 staff are about to be put through their paces. A huge maintenance programme called an outage is about to start. It's a statutory requirement, a chance to make sure everything is in tip-top condition. It's been 18 months in the planning, and it'll involve turning off one of the two reactors for eight weeks. The outage gives engineers access to parts of the power station they normally can't get to when the reactor's working. We have two reactors on site here at Heesham 2, and every three years we completely shut down the reactors and the turbine and we do some really detailed and invasive inspections just to check everything's performing exactly as it should be. There's usually around 15,000 separate tasks that we do during each outage. Um, it's absolutely huge undertaking, uh, and we really have to take the time and make sure we get it right to keep everyone safe and make sure the plant remains as reliable as we need it to power all these homes. So it's a bit like stripping back the engine of a car, then? Engineers absolutely love the outage time because when the plant's up and running, we are very much in monitoring mode and checking that everything's working OK. But during the outage, we can get under the skin and we can see exactly what's happening with the equipment. Now, I'm an engineer to training and I just love the outage because I love to see how my equipment's operating. And all my engineers are just the same. It's fascinating. They think it's brilliant. Uh, it's just a great time to be involved in the industry. So. How do you safely turn off a nuclear reactor? Each power station at Heesham has a control room simulator where that scenario is played out. This is an exact replica of Heesham 2's nerve centre, and it's where I'll find out what a complex job it can be. So one of the most common scenarios that we do practice, which with near enough every exercise that we do, is we'll be practicing putting the reactor in a safe state, so reactor shut down. Right, shutting the whole reactor down? That's right, yeah. Rob Piercy is an experienced control room operator who's going to guide me through the complicated process. We'd shut down from up here and uh, we do it with the big red one. OK, and you're going to let me you let me do it. It's this big red button here, that is it? That's correct. But before you do... OK, sorry, sorry. OK, yep. You'd have to run it by the uh, supervisor. So okay. you need to get consent from Jonathan that you're about to press the right button at the right time. So you'd say to Jonathan, Jonathan, I'm about to trip Reactor 7. OK. Jonathan, I'm about to trip Reactor 7. You're going to trip Reactor 7, carry on. OK, so I'm just going to lift this up. Just push it. That's it. Oh! OK, I didn't realise the alarms were going to go off. I know, yeah. So there's quite a lot happens in the first five minutes of a Reactor trip. There's so many different flashes from so many different places. There's a strict protocol. Everything has to be turned off in the right order. I'm really surprised that you're not ringing people and pressing lots of buttons and turning lots of knobs. You've just got a binder out. Yeah, so that's exactly why we practice it on the simulator. So in this safe environment, we can practice this reactor trip over and over again. So when we're faced with this upstairs in the real world, then we're a lot calmer and we know what sort of situation that we find ourselves in. So if I were to put my application in, do you reckon I could do the training? Uh, 18 months might be a stretch, but maybe two years. <laughs> <laughs> there was a bit of hesitation there, wasn't there? <laughs> 
Britain's relationship with nuclear energy goes back almost 70 years. Back then, the country was leading the charge into a new atomic age. It is with pride that I now open Calder Hall, Britain's first atomic power station. Calder Hall, which was built at Sellafield, had a dual role. It provided power for the nation and plutonium for the military. And soon power stations with Magnox reactors were installed around the UK. But the industry had a troubled start. A fire at Windscale in Cumbria in 1957 was Britain's worst nuclear accident. And the long-term storage of radioactive nuclear waste remains an issue. Plans for nuclear power at Hesham were drawn up in the 1960s, with new gas-cooled reactors at its core. The technology is so advanced, so complicated, so beautiful, so careful, that you can understand why those involved in nuclear engineering become so enthusiastic. Building work straddled two decades and involved thousands of workers. It was a massive jobs boost for this part of the northwest of England. Engineers are now loading the first charge of fuel into Reactor 1. This is done using one of the reactor hall cranes to lift the fuel elements. The operation is the prelude to raising power later this year. Once state-owned, both are now run by the French company EDF. Like the rest of the country's nuclear stations, Hesham is a critical national asset. It's guarded by officers from the Civil Nuclear Constabulary, and it's their brief to deter any threats. This looks like a lot of kit. Uh, it weighs about 30 kilos once it's all on. It's like a workout, then, wearing it. You kind of get used to it after a while. So talk me through it, what's on here? So, routinely, we carry the, uh, the rifle. Yeah, on top of that, with another firearm, we carry the personal protection weapon, and then we'll carry the other things that you recognise, as in the taser, the CS gas and a baton, as well as all the ammunition that goes with it. Which are all less lethal options, um, should we need to resolve a situation via the least um, intrusive measure. You go for those first? Yes. Yeah. There's regular training to keep officers on their toes, with an increased emphasis on counter-terrorism. Unfortunately, it's the modern day and age of threat we've got and also what we're protecting, the importance of the nuclear power to the country requires this standard of level to protect it. Armed officers like Sergeant Rob Jones and PC Darren Adams are on site 24-7 every day of the year. Seeing a full armed police force based on this site, it's a huge deterrent to anyone looking to um, gain access to this facility. Also, it also offers the site workforce and reassurance when they're going about their daily business, and that's a, that goes the same for the uh, local community as well. What did you do before? How did you find yourself in these jobs? Uh, before I did this, I served in the Royal Navy, and then before I did that, I was a holiday rep. So slightly a bit different from a bit when of I started, a but uh, yeah. What about you, Rob? I was a vehicle refinisher, so I was carrying a spray gun, <laughs> um, and then obviously I've changed a complete change of career and carried a live one. Britain's nuclear cops don't just limit themselves to power stations. Their jurisdiction extends five kilometres from the site. They often help local police and attend major terrorist incidents across the country. But a key part in keeping Hesham safe is working with the community. Sometimes our greatest form of intelligence, because they're here more than we, because it's the area they live in. Quite often we are flagged down as we're driving around like we are now and members of the public will say something they've seen that stands out or something they're not happy with. So it's not just what we see, it's also what we're told. Back at Westinghouse's Springfields fuel facility near Preston, they're preparing to dispatch another nuclear consignment. And it's Alan Marshall's job to make sure it leaves the factory safely. And Alan takes his job very seriously. As a forklift driver, you take responsibility of your truck and make sure it's in full, correct working order. So I've done the windows, I'm happy, I'm good to go. So on that basis, I'm going to get rid of Basil. Thank you. Alan's worked at Springfields for 34 years and has been loading fuel for the last 15. Beautiful, there it goes. In his little slot. 
Happy days. We don't like rally driving in forklift trucks. They're not, they're not the most forgiving of the uh, vehicles. Definitely nothing of that nature. Speed in a forklift truck is your enemy, full stop. Everything needs to be done in a nice, controlled, slow, steady manner. And with this particular cargo, that's exactly how we approach it. It's a very niche, bespoke product. Uh, it's got a, a good value to it. I'm, I'm not obliged to tell you the value of it, and quite truthfully, it's on a need-to-know basis, and they deem that I don't need to know, so that's fine. It, it may look just like any box, but it's not just any old box. It's a specific box for a specific product, and it goes on to that trailer, which is fully designed for that box. There are checks that the right fuel is going to the right place. All of those have got to be put to bed properly, so everything's got to be done in accordance to the transport regs. That's the transport department. Once they're happy and they're all done and dusted, all locked up, picked up and lifted and shifted. Wrapped and strapped, lifted and shifted, as I'd like to say. And with the paperwork sorted, another cargo heads off to keep Britain's lights on. Back on the Lancashire coast, Hesham 2's outage is about to start. And the control room is a hive of activity. Years of training is about to come into play as a one million horsepower reactor is turned off. This is the first time cameras have been allowed to see this moment at Hesham, and the atmosphere is super calm given what's at stake. Five, four, three, two, one, good. With the press of a button, control rods are inserted into the reactor stopping the nuclear chain reaction. The temperature at its core rapidly drops and excess steam is vented away. With one reactor and its turbine now out of action, a small army of engineers can get to work. The outage is underway, but normal life continues at Hesham 2. Chemist Beth Thomas is monitoring the water that's used in the boilers in the reactor hall. It comes from the regular water supply, but it's further purified at Hesham. We're testing for really, really low levels of anions and compounds, so we're looking for parts per trillion, so one, one um, tiny part Teeny in tiny. a trillion yeah, of, um, of species in the water, and we're controlling our, our feed water to really, really tight a specification to make sure that our water is super pure when it goes in and really good for our boilers. Hundreds of thousands of samples are tested every year. We make sure that it's within really tight specification for things like pH um, and oxygen um, so that we're protecting the metal within, within the boilers for the lifetime of them. Around 17% of EDF's nuclear staff are female and Beth was inspired by her dad Martin who's clocked up more than 30 years at Hesham 2. She always enjoyed tinkering about with things, fixing things. And I always thought, you know, she would be good in some sort of industry like this, where she could use her brain to make things better and inspire people. Amazing, really, isn't it? Over 35 years ago, this... Uh, so Martin arranged a power station visit for eight-year-old Beth and her sister that took them to the very heart of the nuclear process. The safety engineer gave them a little hard at each <laughs> and uh, took, I took them up on the power cap, which is, was finished, so she, they were actually stood on a live reactor. I just remember thinking, like, how can, how can I be stood here on the top of a nuclear reactor with all of that horsepower and 660 megawatts underneath me, but I have... You can't, you, it's silent. It was just, it was fascinating to me, really, and that sort of set me off on this um, 
trajectory and mission. You must be very through. proud then. I am proud, yeah, very, very proud. You know, she's done better than I have. I don't think she's finished yet, so we'll have to wait and see. Hesham 2's outage has been a massive undertaking. A thousand extra staff have been brought in to overhaul one of its reactors and turbine. It's been well planned, but seven weeks in, something happens that no one had predicted. In his televised address, Boris Johnson said the country was facing a moment of national emergency and sweeping new restrictions on people's movements have come into force around the UK as the government tries to halt the spread of the coronavirus. The measures I urge you at this moment of national emergency to stay at home, protect our NHS and save lives. With Britain in lockdown, it's uncharted territory for the staff working on the outage. The company had a, a, a procedure, a process for, uh, for dealing with uh, pandemics. Uh, unfortunately, that process didn't really consider a pandemic and an outage at the same time. Andy Pyle is the outage manager. It's been a tough balancing act with social distancing, self-isolation and nuclear safety to look after. It's required us to think a little bit on our feet. I guess the first uh, thing is that uh, the power station workers have all been given critical worker status uh, because of our importance to national infrastructure. And for station boss Mark Lees, it's key that Hesham plays its part in powering Britain. We have one unit offline for the outage, uh, but we have another unit at full load supplying electricity to the country. Now, we fully appreciate that uh, we are not as much in the front line as some of the doctors and nurses that really help in the country through this, but all the staff have had this real desire and commitment to provide the low carbon electricity that we, we do, we provide for those who are absolutely on the front line of handling this coronavirus pandemic. 81 days after it started, and with around £30 million spent on maintenance and improvements, Hesham 2's outage is over, and the reactor is back online and connected to the grid. It's been a momentous episode in the history of nuclear power on this site, and there are big changes on the horizon. Both power stations are nearing the end of their life. Hesham 1 is due to close in 2024. Hesham 2 will cease operations in 2030. Decommissioning will take decades. This nuclear story is far from over. The nuclear industry, I personally think, still got a fantastic era ahead of it. We're obviously building uh, the new plant at Hinkley Point C, and there's quite a number of other projects still being talked about in the UK. The electricity industry is so different now than when I started 30 years ago, uh, and it'll continue to change, and I think nuclear's got a really strong part in that as uh, time moves forward.